Good evening everyone. I hope you're well and welcome to our webinar on foot and ankle treatment. My name is Morella and I'll be your host for this evening. Our expert presenters are consultant orthopaedic surgeon Mr Bao Dingsa and sports medicine podiatrist Mr Liam, Liam Stapleton. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session so if you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation please do so via the Q&A icon which is on the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. If you would like to book your consultation, we'll provide contact details at the end of this session. Please note the webinar is being recorded. I'll hand over now to Mr. Liam Stapleton and you'll hear from me again shortly. Hello everybody, um, welcome to our webinar. Um, me and Bal are gonna take you through a little whistle stop tour of uh, foot and ankle pathology and some of the treatments are available for some of the common conditions. Um, I am a specialist in podiatric sports medicine. Um, I've been a consultant at Benedin for about five or six years now, uh, registered with all the appropriate bodies, Royal College of Podiatry and uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, postgraduate qualifications in sports medicine and foot and ankle surgery. Um, my specialty is uh, conservative treatment of foot and ankle, of foot and ankle injury, um, primarily musculoskeletal and, and sports injuries. I do some guest lecturing, different universities, primarily Queen Mary University of London. Um, and I have a special interest in uh, ultrasound scanning, diagnostic ultrasound and injection therapies. So the podiatry services available at Benedin. Um, so for myself, certainly consultation and treatment. Um, uh, we do ultrasound scanning, which is where we can diagnose complaints in uh, in the clinic during your consultation. It speeds up that consultation and diagnose, diagnosis uh, process. Do a variety of image guided injections, minor nail surgery and growing toenail surgeries, uh, done in outpatients. We do shockwave therapy, uh, orthosis, gait analysis, and obviously referral for things like uh, foot and ankle surgery with Mr. Dinsa here. Um, so some common conditions we're going to discuss, uh, problems with your big toe, hallux, um, Mort's your own, which is trap nerve in the forefoot, capsulitis, plantar plate injuries, hallux valgus, ingrowing toenails, some rear of the foot pathologies like arthritis is very common, uh, ankle ligament injury problems, plantar fasciitis, uh, flat foot problems, Achilles tendon problems. So in the forefoot, one of the most common problems we see is problems with your big toe or hallux. Hallux limitus or registers um, normally caused by arthritic changes in the joint, um, causes limitation in movement. So basically that can cause pain in the joint or commonly it can cause pain as you compensate for the lack of movement. Uh, and the uh, hallux valgus is um, is where the big toe deviates and um, is no longer in a straight position. Uh, again, it's very common, and really, this is that's something Bao, Mr. Dinsa, is going to talk about in uh, detail in his part of this presentation. Um, sesamoiditis and sesamoid injuries are also the two little bones under your big toe, and they're easy to be injured. Um, generally, you'll find pain on the ball of the foot um, normally during exercise or immediately after exercise and pain on the first step. Um, the, now, metatarsalgia um, is something you hear a lot about and there are different causes of it. Metatarsalgia itself being uh, a descriptive term of the pain that you feel, a bit like headache or back pain. A couple of common reasons for this. A Morton's neuroma essentially is a trapped nerve in the forefoot. This is a really common problem. Um, uh, as it progresses, the nerve gets thicker it gets more compressed and it tends to give a burning numbness, pins and needles, electric shock pains, both in the ball of the foot and extending into the toe. Now, often there's a, a, an overlap with this, with uh, capsulitis and plantar plate injury, um, often caused by biomechanic overload. So when uh, normally your second metatarsal joint, uh, the second toe joint um, is, is overworking, this tends to feel a bit more like a stone in a shoe, um, bruised kind of feeling, inflammatory pain. 
Um, it can feel swollen in itself as well. There is uh, an overlap between uh, the overload of that joint and the neuroma, and often you get both existing together, um, which makes it slightly more complicated to, to treat. Um, if uh, the, the capsule of the swollen joint capsule is left and, and not treated, it can cause damage to the, the ligament that's underneath. You get plantar plate tears and rupture, and this is when you start to notice the, ham the toe starts to hammer and can dislocate. So rear foot, one of the most common things I'm gonna see in clinic um, is plantar fasciitis. Essentially that's pain in the center of the heel. Um, normally most people describe pain on the first step when they get out of bed in the morning, he's off after 10 minutes of walking around and then build through the day as they've been active. We estimate that about 10% of the UK population has this during their lifetime. Um, it, normally we have a gradual onset um, uh, of symptoms, although it can come on suddenly and sometimes you can tear your plantar fascia. And if we think that is the case, then definitely um, we will need to perform an ultrasound scan. Um, it's commonly misdiagnosed. So I see a lot of referrals in clinic for plantar fasciitis for pretty much anything that hurts on the bottom of your foot. Um, but then most of them, a lot of things I see that are referred because they think of that are not. Um, plantar fasciitis can self-resolve uh, if you're suffering with it after two years, you, you probably know it, I'm not that. Um, arthritis, so ankle arthritis, subtotal joint arthritis are really common, um, can be the result of injury and certainly injury, historic injury that goes back, uh, you know, can be 10 or 15 years earlier or more. Um, Midfoot arthritis is also something I see a lot of, again, caused by trauma um, or caused by uh, collapse in the arch. Um, hypermobility can cause it as well because it destabilizes the joint. Um, arthritic pain, generally stiffness, loss of range of movement. Um, mild inflammatory pain and then mechanical pain. So pain when it moves, um, pain after you've been resting for a while. So when you've been asleep and you get up in the morning, get up first in the morning, it tends to hurt. Um, occasionally, if it's very bad, it can cause night pain. So pain that wakes you up in the night. Getting that, you've probably waited a bit too long to get seen. So make a, make a, uh, a note to definitely make it priority to get that seen. So something we see a lot of both me and Mr. Dinsa here is, is an adult acquired flat foot. So this isn't a normal flat foot. People normally, naturally, some people are naturally flat footed um, and then normal. If they function well with a flatter foot, that's fine. If you didn't always have a flat foot and one of your feet becomes flat or one and then the other becomes flat, as you often see, um, that and, and then that isn't normal. Uh, and certainly when you get pain uh, and you get a difficulty when you're actually walking struggling to stand on one leg these are the sorts of things you you should look out for with a flat foot um, one of the tests we have for this being a problem is whether or not you can stand on tiptoes uh, if you can raise easily up on tiptoes with no pain and very little difficulty especially on one foot it's probably not a problem um, if you can't then it may well be worth having this seen um, so the most common reason for this starts as a problem with one of your tendons, the tendon that holds the arch up in your foot called your tibialis posterior tendon. This can be degenerate, can get weak, uh, it can be torn, you ruptured. Um, hypermobility is another predictive factor for this. Um, essentially, the more mobile, more flexible your foot is, uh, the harder the soft tissues have to work to uh, maintain the arch and maintain function. You tend to notice a gait pattern. So one foot, if one foot's affected, one foot really isn't doing very much pushing. It's a propulsive. So you'll see some walk along and foot's kicked out to the side, like the photograph here. One foot's doing all the work, the other foot's doing very little at all. Um, this can lead to deformity in arthritis if not seen early. And that's often when they get into Mr. Dinsa's hands um, and he has to perform magic to get you back. Um, literal magic to get you back to uh, to, to normal. Um, we're better off catching these early. I think he'd agree. Um, um, there, are, there are things he could do to fix these. I don't know if that's including your talk yet, 
well, but um, just set you up for that. Um, something I see a lot of in, 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 in clinic and something we treat um, in outpatients is ingrowing toenails. So ingrowing toenail surgery uh, is uh, where we remove a small piece, normally a small piece of ingrowing piece of your nail. Sometimes that can also be, include some of the, the soft tissue, the skin can include the whole nail, depending on how bad it is. But normally it's a small piece of nail. We do this under local anesthetic where we numb the toe. It is almost completely painless, I would say. Yeah, anesthetic stings a little bit, but with the actual procedure itself is painless. Um, normally for recovery in two, three weeks if you're fit and healthy um, and, and a permanent solution. So something we treat with a 97% success rate, um, you know, low risk of, of low risks of associated with it. Um, the the and obviously it's something that if left can cause some serious problems. Um, you know, then there was a, a story when I was training of a young um, professional footballer who lost his toe because it wasn't treated early enough, um, and then obviously subsequently went on to not, not fulfill his career um, because of the infection that he got. So worth having that treated. Um, Achilles tendonitis, Achilles tendinopathy, again, something I see most clinics, to be honest. There are lots of subtypes of Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy. Um, Achilles tendonitis tends to be the, the older name for this um, and now is, strictly speaking, used for uh, Achilles problems associated with inflammatory arthropathy and sort of all your sports injuries, MS, musculoskeletal injuries, and the stuff that mostly falls into minor Mr. Jensen's hands are now called Achilles tendinopathy. Subtypes of this acute uh, or chronic, so acute tend to be more inflamed or feel more inflamed, and chronic tends to be some tendon degeneration and weakening. Um, there's also subtypes amongst that as well with. Uh, calcific change of the tendon, which make it more difficult. Haglund's deformity, which again, um, probably falls more under Mr. Dinser's hands. Um, plantaris is a small tendon that lives within inside your Achilles and that can cause problems too. Um, and commonly bursitis, you see um, some bursitis along with the insertional Achilles uh, types. Um, and obviously we, we separate them between insertional and mid portion Achilles problems. Um, all of these should be tr very treatable. So the, uh, people often live with years and years and years of chronic pain with Achilles problems, and it shouldn't be the case. We have enough tools in our box between us um, for the almost 100% of these to be resolved. So that's something well worth noting if you're suffering for a long, long time. So treatments wise, so I'm going to talk about some of the conservative stuff. So this is the stuff that I do. Um, in our patients at Better Than the Hospital, most every clinic. So um, injections, not all injections are steroid injections. So that's the first thing to say. Um, a steroid is used synonymous with what people might know as cortisone or corticosteroid. Um, uh, essentially, these are painkilling injections or anti-inflammatory injections. Um, really, really useful, certainly when picked for the right patient. Um, there doesn't always have to be a, a limitation on them, depending on how well you tolerate them. Um, they've been used for 70 years and uh, we know more about them than we probably almost do anything else we, we do in clinic. Um, part of the trick with a corticosteroid injection is picking the right diagnosis, picking the right patient, uh, and then guiding the injection. So we do image guided injections in outpatients. Almost all of the injections I'll do will be image guided. Um, uh, we know that something like half of blind injections miss what they're actually trying to trying to inject. Um, and if you have a scanner in clinic, it'd be slightly remiss not to use it, I think. A different type of injection, so sometimes we get a lot of questions about injections and everyone always thinks that they're all the same, that they're all steroid. Um, a sodium hyaluronic injection, um, or sometimes called hyaluronic acid injection, essentially WD-40 um, for rusty joints. So if you have a mild to moderate arthritic joint, these can be useful in uh, relieving some of the mechanical pain. Um, they don't tend to do, change much of the inflammatory symptoms you might get, 
and that's sometimes why I mix them with a corticosteroid and do both. Um, but certainly for the the grinding you might associate with uh, an arthritic joint, it can be really useful. Um, it, in the knee, they've been shown to reduce the need for knee replacement surgery in end stage in end stage patients, patients who need a knee replacement um, by years. So they they have their they have their uses. A different type of injection that I do regularly is a high volume Achilles injection. Now this is called a hydrodissection injection. Um, it's 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 a it's a way of uh, freeing off adhesions onto the Achilles tendon um, with water and local anaesthetic primarily. We do it under guidance. The needle never goes into the body of the Achilles, uh, but uh, separates adhesions. Um, and you can see the inflammatory color Doppler signal on your ultrasound scan and reduce as you do the uh, as you do the injection. Um, it doesn't negate the need to do the rehab afterwards, but certainly gives you a break from the pain you've been having. Most patients walk out pain free. And local anesthetic injections, injections that numb pain, are uh, useful for doing injections um, and it's useful for doing minor ops. Um, and so it's, it's a it's a good it's a good adage um, to have to enable us to do other other procedures in clinic. Um, I will say as well, sometimes we a bit of an old-fashioned way, but sometimes we use a local anesthetic injection if you have two or three diagnoses that come up on a scan. You're not sure which one is the one that hurts. So say you've got three arthritic joints and you want to work out which one hurts the most. We can actually put a small amount of local anesthetic into each joint at a time um, and go and have you walk away and test it. It's really good for working out which joint is the one that's really causing your pain if you've got several joints causing a problem. Now, something I do in clinic and you don't see, it's not around that much is, is shockwave therapy. Shockwave um, has now been proven, although I'm, I've been claiming that it does that for a few years now, um, to stimulate the, the re body to repair itself, essentially. Generally, I use it on Achilles problems and plantar fascia problems. Um, what it's been shown to do is it stimulates tenocytes to um, excites tenocytes. Um, these are the little cells that live within your Achilles tendon, for example, um, to produce the collagen fibers that, that make up the Achilles tendon. If you're going to repair injury, you're going to need to produce these collagen fibers. Um, it, also, it also numbs some of the pain for a short period of time as well, which does help with you doing some of your rehab exercises. Um, we know for Achilles problems that uh, that used in isolation with sessions, three sessions spaced a week apart, that that should improve 80% of patients with Achilles problems and about 75 to 80% of plantar fascia problems. I think when that's coupled with the right rehab program, that's greater. Um, you pick the right patient, pick the right rehab program, I think that we get a greater uh, positive outcome. And I'd probably say it's something closer to 85, 90% in in my practice. Um, it works the opposite to having a steroid injection. So instead of it being anti-inflammatory, it's pro-inflammatory. So you get some inflammatory side effects from it for a short period, um, but it does stimulate the repair of the tissue. Now you can't have tissue repair without having some inflammation. So that's every patient I see with it. And, um, and that's a temporary thing, but the repair is permanent. We know that with shockwave patients, that they continue to improve up to a year beyond having the treatment done. So patients who are 70% better after 30, after three sessions at, at, at three months are improved again at six months and improved again at, at a year. Um, it also has the lowest recurrence rate for these injuries. So if you get better with it, you're less likely to suffer recurrence than any of the other treatments we have. Something I do a lot of, um, orthotics. Um, this is Orthotics have evidence to support their use for certain conditions and do not have any evidence to support their use for other conditions. Um, sometimes they're overused and there's criticism I have probably of my profession that everyone gets a pair. Um, we know they work for certain things. So when we talk about adult acquired flat foot, tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction, midfoot arthritis, um, 
these are nailed on things that, that have been shown in studies that they work. Um, things like plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis, not so much. And you're probably not going to get one from me unless you really want one. Um, you talk me into it and you've tried everything else. Um, the, I think for certain things, we, we know they work. And, and when we know they work, they work brilliantly. Um, and when, you know, and certainly when they're, they're prescribed for the problem you have. One of the things with, with orthotics, there are four, I would say to everyone, there are four, um, four things we have to consider, all right, when you're actually making a, a custom orthotic. So the foot that they're made for, so we take a cast of your foot and there's a bespoke for your foot. Um, they're specific to the injury. So a custom orthotic you had for a plantar fasciitis, maybe you might have had from somewhere else, that won't be the same as we'd use for, for a different condition. Um, they're specific to your footwear. So some footwear, you might better change between similar footwear, like one training shoe to another, one running shoe to another. Um, but the, the, if you can't take a, an orthotic design for a, for a running shoe and put them in a court shoe, for instance, that now with 3D printing, what we can make, is we can make separate orthotics for your court shoes and make orthotics for a four inch stiletto if you want me to. I'm not saying that's what you should be wearing, but we can. We can make almost any size, for almost any shoe. The other thing they're specific for is specific for the sport. So something I do, my specialism, my subspecialism being sports medicine, is that if you play golf, what you'll get from your orthotic will be different to what you run marathons in and what you play football in. Um, if you do five different sports, it is possible you might need more than one orthotic. Um, so we can try and make hybrid pairs um, with a bit of compromise. Um, but that's obviously something we have to take into account because the movements are different movement you have running in a straight line down the road running a marathon is different to what you'd have playing tennis mainly side to side um so yeah we have to consider these things imaging so something i do as mentioned already ultrasound imaging in clinic i think we can probably diagnose 60 70 percent of conditions <coughs> with an ultrasound scanning clinic um and obviously mri we need because ultrasound doesn't really look at bone pathology very well. Um, uh, plain film x-ray, again, something probably about Mr. Dinsa here um, uses almost every day or for, you know, 20 patients a day. Um, brilliant for looking at bone, bone um, anatomy, uh, but not so much soft tissues. Um, and then obviously ultrasound really good for, for, for um, image guided injections where we know we can increase the accuracy of the injection. Um, to the point where I can, I know that I've hit the spot. I know what what I've injected you and where I've put it. Um, we can be very accurate with that. Something I do as well. This leads into some of the orthotics, um, but also into um, rehab prescription, physiotherapy referral. Um, is biomechanics gait analysis um, something I do a lot? Um, this uh, kind of highlights maybe what some of the underlying causes of precipitating factors um, to whatever injury. Um, this can be quite simple. So someone who has a uh, short first metatarsal compared to a second is more likely to have a second metatarsal overload, more likely to have a bung in, more likely to have um, uh, osteoarthritis, the first uh, toe joint. There's a whole ream of different things that makes you more likely to have. Um, these can be quite simple. Sometimes it can be watching someone walk with a slow motion video analysis or pressure plate analysis shows us peak pain, peak peak pressure, um, time exposed to this peak pressure, uh, torsional forces. Um, yeah, it kind of, it, this both tells us maybe why, what maybe the underlying causes for injury are, and also gives us the clues we need in, in writing a prescription for an orthotic or for a, uh, a running shoe or writing a rehab program, um, highlighting weak muscles, weak movement patterns. Um, so it gives us gives us all the clues, not all the clues, some of the clues we need once we have a diagnosis that that is that is solid. So that's a bit of an overview on everything about me and what I do in clinic. Now we're over to, to Bao. He's going to talk about some of the magic he does. Um, he's a bit of a magician. And so sometimes you see some of these patients, they look completely different when he's come they come back out of um, out of his hands. Um, uh, I let him I'm looking forward to him talking through this next bit. Um, hopefully I haven't overrun so long that he can't 
can't catch up for us. Cheers, Bell. Thank, Looking you. To this. Thank you, Liam. And thank you for a great uh, talk. That was really, uh, really good and thorough. Um, pretty much like my practice, Liam's helped me with my talk because he's covered most of the, my talk regards to non operative management. And I think, like my practice, the non operative management is the key part. Just when you see me, when you see me, doesn't mean you're going to get a surgery. I think surgery is a last resort for most of these conditions. And therefore, I often seek Liam's help to manage these uh, my patients. And it's uh, when the non operative measures have failed that we then consider. Uh, surgery. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I studied at Guys and St Thomas's. I trained in the South East. I have a sports interest very similar to Liam and I think that helps the management of our patients because when we see the patients that uh, are sporty and want to get back to those activities, it helps us understand the rehabilitation and their expectations. Um, I currently work in the South East uh, of Kent and London. I'm also going to apologise now. I'm not being bossy or thinking above myself, but Liam's controlling the PowerPoint. So I'm going to have to say, uh, change side, please, every now and again. There, can you change the side, please, Liam? For some reason, it's not, not working. Oh. It's always good. Morel, can you help us? Oh, no, yeah. Is that, that the next one? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, OK. Wrong button. Cheers. Um, you notice from the, what I've um, put down here as the common conditions I see, they're very similar to Liam, if not nearly identical. And this really represents the sort of patients we see, the common conditions. And um, Liam's, uh, there'll be a bit of overlap between what Liam's mentioned, so I'll try and avoid too much of that. And I'll try and focus on the surgical options for these patients. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, this is not working very well, is it? No. So it's not, it doesn't want to be to click forward. All right, okay. It's a bit of a slow, sorry everyone. Sorry everyone. Um, uh, Bunyan's, as um, Liam went briefly over Bunyan, so he left, left me something to talk about that, which is great. <laughs> Bunyan's, as, as Liam said, is when the toes point towards the second toe. There's normally the eminence on the medial side, so the bump you can see on the inner aspect of the foot that causes problems. And most of this is due to footwear issues. And now it's commonly thought that people that have hallux valgus is due to the foot, uh, footwear they wear. Whilst I think that's a contributing factor, I don't think it's the main one, because often patients I see are wearing sensible shoes their whole life and they still develop abundant. So I think there is a genetic component to it, which causes soft tissue laxity, which causes the big toe to turn. And as a result, we get an imbalance of the soft tissues. Um, uh, change side, please. So options included, uh, commercially available, are things like splints. In my opinion, whilst they may relieve the symptoms while they're being worn, they're not particularly uh, a long-term solution. And as soon as they're off, they go back into their normal position of a Alex valgus position and get the same pain again. So unless you're willing to wear these sort of supports uh, continuously, they're not going to provide much benefit. And uh, most of the patients subjectively that I've uh, spoken to who have tried these have found them not particularly helpful, but they are an option to avoid surgery. The important thing, this is where uh, Liam particularly will get involved in, is when someone has a bunion, you also need to look at their hind foot. And often it might be related to a flat foot and a, a tibialis posterior deficiency. And that can make the, the uh, bunion look worse because the toe starts turning. So you shouldn't just address the bunny, you need to, need to look at the flat foot as well and see if that will resolve the issues. Now, if it's a hallux valgus, a uh, clear hallux valgus, and it's not getting better, it's causing problems with footwear, the option is surgery. Um, I did have some x-rays, but you can't show them on the presentation because um, it won't be allowed to be, because uh, it makes it over 18. It can't be published online. But the way to correct this is you make an incision on the inside of the foot, and you, you have to break the bone of the metatarsal bone to shift it and realign it. Then you hold it with a screw. And then you do a similar sort of incision just above the joint and then with a, and you hold that with a staple. And the idea is to correct the alignment and the deviation between the first and second toes. And this is called a scarf and aching osteotomy. There's a new modern techniques called minimally invasive surgery. And this is where it's done through keyhole surgery where there's small little 
five millimeter incisions are made and the bones cut with a burr rather than opening it up and it's held with slightly larger screws with the benefit being that it's a smaller incision. But the recovery is similar with both options and it'd be six weeks in a, a surgical slipper which they can wait there on and uh, at six weeks we get x-rays and if all looks good to get back into their normal shoes. It's important to be wary of the fact that uh, there is uh, swelling which will go on for at least six months to a year, particularly in the evenings, and get better with elevation uh, by the morning. Uh, thank you, Liam. And uh, Liam mentioned a lot uh, nicely about capsulitis, metatarsalgia. The patients I often see often present with uh, either amato, which you can see here, a clauto, which involves uh, hyperflexion of both interphalangeal joints and a hyperextension of the metatarsal phalangeal joint, or a mallet toe. And it's important, as Liam described, to look at the capsule, the metatarsal phalangeal joint, and see how that affects, because the deformity is, tends to be from the metatarsal phalangeal joint, and then it causes problems in the interphalangeal joint. Now, in the early stages, this can be managed uh, non operatively with um, toe slings or support to prevent dorsal um, ulceration or irritation, as you can, that has occurred in these pictures. Uh, when it becomes more rigid, and then you're looking at doing more comfortable uh, shoes, wider fitting shoes to make it more uh, manageable. Uh, new slide, please. Such as uh, these options. How often, when it becomes a rigid deformity and the shoes become more and more uncomfortable, you may then need to consider surgical options. And um, as I said, you need to start further away from the tips of the toe and then move towards the tips of the toe slowly. So we tend to find that they have plantar clostes underneath the balls of their feet, and this is due to the metatarsals coming, uh, hitting the ground on the plantar aspect. So we often have to start with shortening of the plantar, meta, uh, the lesser metatarsals, which is a vals osteotomy. Once we shorten them, we then assess the interphalangeal joints. And if they're still rigid and, um, and they're not straightening out, we may need to fuse those joints. And that often requires putting a wire into the toe and the wire hangs out the tip of the toe for about six weeks. And then we pull that wire out at six weeks in clinic. And this will lead to a nice flattened uh, toe, straightened toe, which will stop the irritation. The obvious risks of this being that it's a rigid toe from there, so they'll they, they they lose the flexion extension at interphalangeal joints. It means their shoes, uh, their foot's more comfortable in shoes, which makes them able to get back to uh, activities. Uh, thank you, Liam. Um, of note, also we mentioned earlier, Liam did mention um, plantar rupture. If it's noticed that there is a plantar rupture, we can obviously consider a plantar plate repair as well, which is a surgical technique to improve the position to the, uh, and to allow the toes to sit down. But this would be done as an uh, additional procedure to what I've mentioned previously as well. Thank you. Um, hallux rigidus, as Liam said, this is a painful metatarsal uh, flanger joint of the hallux. It can vary from uh, early arthritic changes to spurs with small spurs to global arthritic changes and a fairly rigid joint, as you can see in this x-ray. In the um, early stages, it can be symptom relief with a mortems type splint. Uh, you can try injections, uh, steroid injections, which I tend to do, um, do I, uh, I, if I do them, I do them in theatre, but I find that's a bit of a hassle for patients. So I try to do image, image guided. So someone like Liam, who's appropriately skilled, can do an ultrasound guided injection, and this ensures it's in the right place. And that tends to be a steroid and local anaesthetic. If it's more of a mechanical problem and there's a clear spur formation, which is uh, restricting the range of motion, then the early steps could be uh, what we call a colectomy, where we make an incision over the top of the toe and we remove the spurs to increase the range of motion. And this is beneficial in the early stages, but not in the later stages, because if you increase the range of motion and there's significant arthritis, you increase the movement of bone and there's more bone on bone rubbing, which can lead to conversely more pain. So therefore, uh, doing, removing the spurs and someone that's got significant arthritis isn't a good option because it can lead to more pain. Um, when it's progressive like this x-ray, I think we're really looking at uh, fusion or replacement. And the gold standard is a fusion where we join uh, both bones together, remove all movement from the joint, and therefore the pain is relieved. And when people think of fusion, they often feel that this is, uh, it affects their gait, it, it affects their ability to do their activities. And whilst it does have an impact on gait, and Liam will say it affects their gait analysis, and I think we both agree with that, most people can leave a fairly active life with a fusion, and we do it in young people. 
in a slightly older, more sedentary, sedentary people, we can consider replacement, which is with a elastic implant. And this is what we sort of do for the more elderly sedentary patients, because it allows some movement and preserves some of the other joints so they can uh, do things, because they won't be able to cope as well with a rigid joint as well as younger people. Thank you, Neil. Normally one of the things I find on the gait analysis is it improves their gait post-fusion than it, than it was before they had it done. It affects right. the gait positively. Um, normally the gait's so bad with a painful um, arthritic first MTP with limited movement that it improves things normally. Oh, and is that because they're offloading and using the lateral, uh, yeah. lateral column more? Yeah, normally you set the angle of the of the toe up at like five degrees of that, don't you? And yeah. it enables them to toe off through your big toe, whereas when it's painful, they're just not, they don't, it doesn't touch the ground. Now pressure plate analysis where it doesn't even touch the ground um, yeah. before before surgery. So oh, that's good to know, brilliant, thank you. And um, that, uh, Liam just made, made an interesting point there about the five degrees of uh, positioning of a hyperextension. We can adjust that. And with the plates we use, you can adjust it. So I have done a fusion in a dancer. You need to go on demi point. So. They, they weren't too wide back going to normal shoes. So I actually put it in a, toe, a position where the toe was quite extended so that they could do, do demi point and still teach dance. Obviously, she struggled getting to normal shoes as a result, but she's able to carry on being a teacher. Uh, Mortis Duroma, uh, Leah mentioned uh, the common symptoms of, uh, and uh, findings when we see the patients. Um, the, the thing that's interesting is that we say neuroma, but it's not really a neuroma. It's a more of a trauma related inflammation around the nerve. So the, the terminology is slightly incorrect. Uh, but as Liam said, it is down to a, a, the impact and the inflammation around there. And uh, it can be contributory to a very tight calf musculature, which leads to fourth foot overload as well. So it's important when you, we see someone with Morton's neuroma, we look at the, the tendon Achilles and look at the gastrocnemius and slayers and the impact this can have. Because just removing the neuroma may resolve that symptom, but it may not resolve the other problem. So we need to look at all of that as one. Um, my first line of treatment is always ultrasound, uh, as Lean can do, and then uh, measuring the size of the mortadroma, confirming its presence, and then doing a steroid injection in the same city. I find that often resolves the, the problems and resolves the symptoms. If it doesn't, then we consider surgery. And the surgery would be an incision over the top of the foot, and unfortunately it is, it's quite um, uh, destructive surgery, it's removing the nerve. So they will have numb toes afterwards but it solves their problems. And, it, and as I said, it's, it's, most of the surgery I'm not suggesting is all last resort. And it's when the symptoms have been so significant that they'd rather have that surgery than live with their symptoms. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, just a picture here. There's a picture of me doing a blind injection. Uh, I used to do this in, early, in my early years of training. I certainly haven't done it as a consultant in the last five years. I think it's quite important to really do it with ultrasound guidance to make sure you're getting it in the right place. And other, as I mentioned there, looking at the biomechanics, uh, looking at um, adjusting footwear, metatarsal pads. I don't think meta metatarsal pads, I always offer it as an option, but I think it's more about getting the right footwear and having a firm uh, uh, cushion to, um, to the, the foot area and the metatarsal area. Thank you, Liam. Uh, Midfoot arthritis. Uh, this can be ranged from the navicular cuneiforms to um, the tenovicular area and the cuboid area, which is where all the pink area is on this picture. Patients often complain of pain and swelling. It can feel like it's coming from the ankle, but when you do uh, for examination, it, it's more in the midfoot and it comes more with rotational movements. In the early stages, often they can feel a bone spur and it's difficulty wearing shoes because when they're wearing shoes, the compression on that spur can irritate the nerves as well. And they can lead to altered sensation in, in the foot. So uh, in the first instance, once again, is non optic measures, changing the footwear, doing something which I call a skipper lace technique. So if they wear shoes with laces, removing the laces over the prominence because that can relieve the pressure as well. And then insoles, um, and even potentially using a rocker bottom type shoe to try and offload that area and prevent pain. If that doesn't work, then we need to look at surgery. Um, before that, as Liam mentioned, I always try uh, guided injections because that can give symptom relief and avoid the need for surgery because surgery can be quite drastic as a long recovery period. So I always offer injections in the first instance if it's sensible. If there's clear bone on bone arthritis, then I don't do that. But if it's a stage where I think uh, you can get a needle into the joint, I would always offer an injection first. Thank you, Liam. Uh, surgical, uh, sorry, non-optimal measures, we mentioned the injections and uh, rocker bottom type shoe and insoles. 
Thank you. And the surgical options, I think if it's just a spur and our, our fritting changes aren't too bad on uh, imaging, uh, I would certainly consider just doing a removal of the spur to reduce, uh, reduce the compression of the nerves and the soft tissues, uh, allow footwear to be well worn comfortably. If there's more progressive arthritis, I have to say I tend to get a CT scan rather than rely purely on x-rays to get a real picture of where the uh, arthritic changes are. Um, if injections have failed, non-operative measures have failed, then we'd look at fusions. And if, uh, the few the idea of fusion, just like with the big toe, is to remove the movement and therefore it re reduces the pain. The knock-on effect is that they have reduced uh, a movement in a fairly important part of the foot, which can have knock-on effect on the other joints in the long term. Uh, the configuration you can use is either screws, staples, or plates, as you can see here. And the idea is to get the alignment of the metatarsal going into talus in a clear parallel line, as you can see here, rather than having a, a break in it, which you often see in a midfoot arthritis. Um, the, the key components of this is the risk that the, the, uh, the union doesn't work, it goes into non-union, and it's a long recovery. You're looking at six weeks in a calf's non-weight bearing, and then a period of six weeks in a boot where you can put weight on. They can take up to a year to fully recover from it. And so it is a long recovery. It's really important to get the right uh, selection of patients and to counsel the patients appropriately for this. And hence my, um, uh, my uh, reluctance to go straight for this. And I certainly think this is an option of last resort. Thank you, Liam. Uh, ganglions, um, these are fluid collections which can come from either the joint or synovial sheath. Uh, once again, it's a bit like midfoot arthritis. A lot of the problem comes from uh, pain from um, compression on neighboring structures or difficulty wearing footwear. Um, they tend to uh, resolve and some of them do go back and uh, they can fluctuate between sides. Uh, I get a lot of referrals for aspirations. Um, I personally don't aspirate just because of, I found that when I've done that as a trainee, they tend to come back every week because they reoccurred. And so therefore I, I'm fairly resistant to do it. But I do do it in those uh, patients that have got other comorbidities and surgical intervention wouldn't be safe for them. I recently saw someone who had a lot of comorbidities. They had no uh, uh, benefit from having a uh, anesthetic to have the surgery. And so I did aspirate in that circumstance. I said that I don't do it very often. Um, I tend to get imaging to confirm it's a ganglion. And then the surgery is an incision over this area of uh, prominence. And you try and remove the ganglion as, uh, as one. That's often very difficult to do. It often pops as you try to um, get it out. But you find the stalk. It's, it's a bit like um, a balloon. You have the sac and you have a stalk of where the fluid's coming from. It's important to find that stalk and destroy it with a diaphragm to prevent the risk of reoccurrence. I think if you do that, it's, it's a good chance they don't reoccur. Always send the sac off to the pathology lab to ensure it is a ganglion. And the uh, recurrence rates, if you do that, are quite low. But the risks of the surgery are you having a scar in an area which can be uncomfortable. And if it becomes a hypertrophic scar, that can be worse than what the ganglion was. And there's a risk of nerve damage, particularly for this one here, is around the superficial cranial nerve. So they can get some numbness and uh, around the top of the foot. Thank you, Liam. Uh, and ankle arthritis. Um, once again, uh, we're quite conservative with this. Uh, most of it tends to be post-traumatic. Uh, unlike the other joints, such as hips and knees, primary arthritis is re relatively rare. It tends to be uh, secondary to arthritic changes or, sorry, it's secondary to trauma. Or if, even if it's not a fracture, it may be repetitive sprains. And each time there's a bit of cartilage that's been damaged, which then leads to post-traumatic arthritis. The next uh, common cause is inflammatory or uh, gout-related arthropathy. Um, the other type of patients you see quite often with pain at the front of the ankle are football players. I'm sure Liam sees these. And they get the footballer's spur. And this is just due to the mechanism of uh, kicking the ball and running. They develop a spur at the front of the joint. And this causes impingement and difficulty in movement. And for those patients, you can consider doing keyhole surgery, arthroscopic shaving of the spur. For the arthritic patients, I think in the first instance, once again, is uh, guided injections, whether this is steroid or... Um, hyaluronic acid uh, supplementation, viscose supplementation. So these are options for early stage arthritis. I think for the more uh, aggressive arthritis and end stage arthritis, you're looking more at either fusion or replacement. And uh, the decision between those two options are dependent on the patient and their history. 
I certainly think in the younger active patients, we head more towards fusions and the less active um, and more sedentary patients we tend to do, and the slightly older patients, we tend to do replacements. And this is just because of the fact that the amount of force is going through the ankle, replacements have a lower life expectancy than the hips and knees. And therefore you want to be careful in your patient selection before you offer a replacement. Uh, the benefit of the replacement being that uh, it protects the subtalar joint, the talar and vicular joint, where the fusion leads to increased pressures in those areas. Thank you, Liam. Um, just an example of injections. I'm not sure how Liam does it. I often, if I inject, I do it in the uh, medial side, just next to the tibialis anterior. But I know from going to some of the ultrasound guided courses, people that use ultrasound tend to go anterior lateral. Both, probably. I see where the spur is. And see where the biggest gap is yeah. normally. Yeah. Um, as long as you don't go of... through the middle, you're probably fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Next slide, please. And uh, this is an extra uh, example of some fusions and replacements. As I said, um, the fusions uh, we can do arthroscopic or we can do open. Once it, depend it depends on this, the type of the arthritis and how much space we can find. And also, if there's a um, a deformity associated with it, which we need to correct. And it's often easier done open rather than uh, arthroscopically. But the, both options are available. This x ray is a fairly aggressive x ray, it's not one of mine. I tend to use two screws, which are uh, coming uh, from the tibia into the talus. That tends to do the job. Uh, this x ray uh, is quite aggressive and shows multiple screws in the fibula being taken as well, which we tend not to do. Important in the operative planning is to look at the subtalar joint as well, because if that's involved, you may need to incorporate that in the fusion as well. So often get a CT scan before we go ahead with surgery. Thank you, Liam. Uh, I'll, be, I'll talk very quickly about tendon Achilles. I know you're overrunning. Uh, as uh, Liam said, you can break down the uh, Achilles tendinopathy uh, into mid-substance and insertional. This example of mid-substance. Um, where I say do not, I do not inject, uh, by that I mean I do not inject any steroid around there. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't inject any steroid, but certainly I do do hydro distension and high volume injections to uh, break down adhesions, and that often helps uh, uh, with the patient's uh, rehabilitation. Uh, physiotherapy has a role, as, um, as does um, shockwave, and I do refer a lot of patients for shockwave, so I think this has a role, and subjectively, like Liam, I, I feel that it gets good results, and we're operating on less and less of these patients. And night splints, I'm not a great fan of. I find patients find this a struggle and they don't really, they're not really compliant with it. And surgery for the mid-substance um, tendinopathy isn't great, it's, uh, but we do do it. And it's literally, you make an incision over the tendon Achilles and we open up the tendon and we scrape away, scrape away the dead unhealthy tissue and then retubalize re it, make it nice and um, circumferential and close it up. And the obvious problem being we're creating scar tissue once again. But it reduces the bulk, and that's why patients, patients get some benefit from that. But certainly, um, by increasing the scar tissue there, it can cause problems. And therefore, the importance is the rehab and getting going with activities as soon as possible, and not uh, restricting movements. Um, can you do the next slide, please, Liam? Let me, let me get, this is still more, more mid-substance, but we do get um, insertional tendinopathy, which is more towards the calcaneal insertion. And certainly with the insertional Achilles tendinopathy, it's slightly harder recovery surgically, but we get good results. And the reason it's harder is we, we tend to have to take the tendon Achilles off the calcaneum. We shave off any Caglan's deformity that is present, which is a prominence of the calcaneum. We divide any unhealthy part of the Achilles tendon, and then we reattach it to the heel using uh, suture anchors. And then the patients have to go into a boot for uh, six weeks with um, keeping their foot in equinus, and we slowly bring the foot up to a plantar break position over a six week period. So it's slightly longer recovery, but we get good results from this. And I think we get better results from this than we do from the mid-substance surgery. I think this is because we're clearing off and it creates less scar tissue within the tendon area. Um, obviously, like I said, we'd avoid doing this if possible and we'd try the hydrodistension shockwave and try phasic rehab beforehand. Thank you, Liam. And I think that's it. That was quite a quick whistle top tour. So I hope that was okay. Certainly say some of those Achilles patients, well, they, and when they have the Haglund's deformity, very, very difficult to manage them conservatively. So because yeah. the Haglund's causes compression on the on the Achilles and they get better for a while and then come back again. So sometimes yeah. that, that it's a difficult surgery, but I can see why you'd get positive results from it because, because it's a common recurrence 
with the yeah. insertional tendinopathy because the tendon is not really the issue. It's the bone, the, the shape of the bone. Um, yeah. exactly. So you don't want to do it, but it, 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 it's, sometimes it's needed. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's like you know, when you do the Haglund, you take away that horrible um, inflammatory fatty tissue that you see at the back of the retrocacanal area. And once you get yeah. that out, I think that often there's a pain generator as well. Yeah, it's supposed to have the most nerve endings of anything in that area. So it's yeah. the bit, if that's if that's causing problems, it, that's the bit that hurts. Yeah, we tend to resect that. I think that's what helps. Um, I, you did mention flat feet in your talk, which I didn't go over. Certainly the surgical options for that, um, if it's flexible and it hasn't managed non-operatively, is, uh, is quite significant. You have to break the heel and shift it and you take the diseased tibialis posterior tendon out and take the FDL tendon and put that into the navicular. It's a long recovery and um, whilst the pain goes away the flat foot normally reoccurs but the benefit is that the pain goes away mm. if there's arthritic changes is rigid you're looking at fusion type surgery so i agree with liam that um, we try and avoid that surgery if at all possible and try to use insoles and supports and uh, particularly strengthening up the intrinsic muscles i think help as well i think some of the tendon transfer and orthotics as a couple work yeah. better i think you know because yeah. you you um you're maintaining the the integrity of the of the shape of the foot long term um, and taking away the pain. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, yeah, the combination is good. Yeah. Sorry, Mirella, I think we overran a bit there. That's okay. It's no problem. It's a really interesting um, presentation. So we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So we'll um, we'll just take those. So um, first question is: um, I have been suffering with heel pain for a while now. I have booked in a holiday early next year, which involves quite a lot of walking. If I had surgery before, would I be restricted to how far I could walk? Because um, you mentioned surgery, I'll answer that. Um, it depends what the cause of the heel pain is. I think that, that's what we need to determine because it could be a stress fracture, it could be insertion of police tendinopathy, or it could be plantar fasciitis. And so you really need to identify the cause. If it's plantar fasciitis, surgery really isn't the answer, I don't think. And I think it is uh, non-surgical options which may include needling, but certainly before needling, I'll try shockwave as a first line treatment. And rehab probably. Yeah. You know, it's, um, yeah, but like, like Val said, depends entirely on all the things we do depend on diagnosis. If the diagnosis is right, it all starts falling into place. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question is, I find that many shoes, especially sandals, cause pain for flat feet. Do you have any recommendations for sensible footwear aside from chunky trainers or would you custom orthotics be best? So custom orthotics are difficult to fit in sandals. There are companies that produce sandals that, um, that you can take the footbed out of and replace it with your custom orthotic. Um, the, the lab we use on occasion will also, you can send in a, um, a sandal of your choosing and they will replace the cut the footbed out of it and replace it with a custom orthotic. The limitation is with that is you can't move the orthotic from shoe to shoe. When that sandal will finish their life, that's so is the orthotic. Um, they're permanently in there. So it can be done, but you know, it will set you back a few hundred pounds probably. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is, um, is the main purpose of shockwave therapy to relieve pain or does it improve symptoms in the long term? So yeah, that was part, I guess partly covered in that in my, in my thing, we know it, it's, it has the um, it, it, symptoms continuous to improve for up to a year. And the studies that have been, um, the longitudinal studies that have been done have been um, uh, a year in length because no one studied it beyond that. Um, we know it's got the lowest recurrence rate. So if you get better with it, you're less likely to, um, for it to come back than with any of the other um, treatment options available. So, um, so yeah, it does do that. Um, it, it's both... Uh, it, it's, it's thought that it both numbs some of the pain, so reduces the pain, and um, stimulates your body to repair itself. I think I don't know if you agree, Liam. I think the problem with tendinopathy as well, no one knows if it's a degenerative or an inflammatory repetitive problem. And so yeah. um, no one, no one. That's why you get the variety between shockwave, and you get people that want to have a pro-inflammatory, people that want to deal with the degenerative. The degenerative people tend to want to do surgery. Yeah, and I found it, because we don't know. I think it's more of a mixed picture. That's why Shockwave works because it sort of manages a bit of both options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it takes away some of the pain, so you can do your rehab. Um, 
you know, and stimulates a bit of repair. I've seen them on, on ultrasound scan that you certainly um, reducing the thickness of Achilles tendon, um, both before and then you measure it again after. Um, that yeah, you normally reduce the thickness of the tendon, improves, improves the 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 fibre alignment, the appearance, the the hyper hyper echogenicity of the tendon. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is: um, I am sixty five and enjoy being active. However, I have noticed minor symptoms of arthritis in my foot. How would I prevent this getting worse with age? Some of that depends on where it is. Sometimes it might not be the end of the world if it got worse. So sometimes you, your foot does compensate quite well um, for some quite significant arthritis. We know, and Belle will tell you, that um, arthritis in the big toe is the single most common uh, incidental finding in the asymptomatic population on foot and ankle x-rays. So you go for an x-ray for something else and big toe arthritis shows up. Um, so that, that is common and most people don't get any symptoms with it. So it's you only treat the ones with symptoms. Um, depends where it is. Um, we, we know broadly that um, living an active lifestyle, those living an active lifestyle um, are less likely to suffer degeneration their cartilage of their joints than those who are sedentary. Um, the theory is that regular activity uh, does stimulate some of the cartilage to repair itself. Um, uh, some of that has been, some of those studies are taken from knee problems, um, uh, which is commonly believed to be made worse by things like running. Um, but regular runners have knee cartilage 50% thicker than sedentary people of their own age group. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, we wouldn't stop you from doing being active but maybe support you depending on depending on where it was. Yeah. I think it's very important. I think like you said there, um, loading is important. You need to load it and keep it up, keep it up and the joints supple because the lubrication comes from movement and your ankle uh, has so much load going through it. If you suddenly rest it, it's not going to make it better. It's going to make it worse because it, it loses its normal structure and architecture. So I think loading is important. And that's where our rehabs changed significantly, Liam, hasn't it? Before mm. it used to be about stretching when we have tendinopathy and things. Now it's more about loading. Yeah. Yeah. That's key. So it's about symptom relief. So if you're going for a long walk and uh, you're not going for a walk, maybe take some painkillers just to help you get through it. But it's important to still do the activities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is from D. Has anyone but myself used LLTD for inflammation, infection, or wound healing properties? Also, deep oscillation therapy for drainage. So, low level laser, is low level th laser therapy. Is that what she means? What was the acronym? LL uh, LLTD. Something diode, it's kind of similar to laser therapy, I think, isn't it? Um, Lima Lima um, Tommy Delta. Well, obviously, it's difficult because yeah. it would. I think she's talking about like light therapy or laser therapy. Um, as far, look, as far as the evidence base goes, there's no evidence to support it. So it's not something I do in clinical practice. It's not something I generally refer for. Subjectively, I've heard a lot of my colleagues that um, say good things about it. I would like them to collect data on it and publish it, and then we could all um, give a give an educated opinion on it. Um, oscillated, what was the other thing? That sounds like ultrasound therapy. Is that right? Yep. So... Um, Deep oscillation therapy for drainage. I'm not sure. Um, I, yeah, I, I've not had any experience. No. Okay. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, tell, tell, tell her to ping me, ping us through, email us through some, uh, some information about both. That's probably the best thing. Okay. Um, I think Dee is um, on the webinar, so um, she should be able to um, pick that up. Emails for some through. Yep. Um, so the next question is, at what point would you recommend surgery for pain and loss of movement in the big toe? I feel like I need treatment, but I'm afraid of surgical procedures. Yeah, that's reasonable. Um, my answer to that is when things are bad enough, it's affecting you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's stopping you to doing the things you want to do. So if it's stopping the activities and you're having to think about it because of the toe, I think that's when you need to consider a surgical opinion. And then depending on the examination and the findings, uh, we'd, we'd discuss options of management, whether it be removing the spurs or it be 
fusing the joint. Um, as I said, the fusions doesn't affect your activity too much. Liam pointed out that actually the gait analysis improves after a fusion of the big toe. So certainly that factor uh, and fear of fusions is um, something we can explain and, and, and get around. But if we, uh, if it, it, the key question is, is the symptoms bad enough? And has it been managed with non-optic measures fully? And then, then that, that would be the decision when to operate. And Bell, the success rate for your, say, say for a Halex fusion, a first MT plate uh, fusion, what are, the, what are the success rates? Because one of the things I get a lot in, yeah, one of the things I quote, and I, I quote from the literature as far as I know, that, yeah. that most people are worried about it because they've had a great aunt who had it done in the 80s who had a bad reaction to it. And yeah. kind of, so Halleck Fargo surgery and fusion surgery, the success rate for that is pretty high. Yeah, you better quote the quote the figures. Yeah, the, the, the literature is up there over ninety percent. If you range between eighty eight and ninety five, in my um, my cohort, um, I've been a consultant for five years. I've had to revise one because uh, the screw was backing out, and I've changed now to a plate and screw, so I'm not having any problems with that. All mine have united to date. Um, the only one uh, one didn't actually. Sorry, to tell you about one didn't unite. And that was a rheumatoid patient, and that was where the screw backed out. So um, I then changed it to a plate, and they've all fused. Mm. And uh, the, the, the deformity of the toes have changed now because the plates have the angulation built into it. The idea of getting the, the position of toe wrong is completely gone, which is a historic problem. And uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, aunties having problems. The same with uh, had bunion surgery. Historically, yeah. bunion surgery had a bad name, but actually, with the blocks and the surgery we're doing now, the the pain is a lot less. The majority of my patients do say that wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. I don't, and the test rate's really high for that as well, isn't it? Because that's yeah, that's one of the worries. Yeah, and I think because in the old days it used to be just a shaving of the bone and tightening of the tissue. Now we're actually correcting the alignment and the the, the actual mechanical problem, and that's why we're getting less reoccurrence and better success rates. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so just two more questions. So where do you send people for orthotics? To Liam. Yeah, <laughs> so normally I either take a physical cast of your feet, um, normally weight-bearing cast of your foot in clinic, or I take a 3D scan, non-weight-bearing cast of your foot. Um, I send the, that scan away. So I take a physical cast, I 3D scan the cast that I've taken. And that, that's only because you can't 3D scan a physical a weight bearing impression of your foot. Um, that is sent away to a lab um, in Spain, actually, um, uh, who I write a prescription. So that prescription incorporates the, the injury that you have, your foot type, your activity, um, and the footwear you wanted to go into. And uh, that takes about two weeks. It returns to the clinic in about two weeks' time. But we nearly closed in time here. <laughs> the lights have gone off. <laughs> they, want, they, they want me out of here. Um, and, 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 and so, yeah, about two weeks' time, that comes back. My secretary normally gives them a call, books them in um, for a follow-up, um, and then and then we might fit them. So, yeah, um, we do it. In, it's all done in-house. Well, the, all, the, all the measurement, prescription, everything, and fitting is all done in-house. Um, and the, we have a lab that make what I want. Um, and and well, if things... If things come back not how I want, I will have them made again. So if people, are, you know, I always say, sometimes people get feel like they're going to let left, left high and dry with with an orthotic that's not comfortable. Like that shouldn't happen under any circumstances. Um, if it's uncomfortable, I'll have it taken back and remade. Um, so that that shouldn't be that shouldn't be a problem. And I'd say what Liam does offer as well, he does a gate analysis as well as a, there's another service, and then that is quite good because a lot of time we say, oh, can we have an install? We don't really know what we want and so it's, it's a way of we, we, we don't want surgery but we need something done and Liam actually assesses the whole limb assesses the mechanical axis the gait and then it works out what's best for the patient yeah. and so therefore I think it's very good in the active young patients as well because he doesn't treat everyone the same and so it's very good with the off-the-shelf insoles are one size fits all yeah so tend not to like off the shelf at all um, and I use the analogy if you had a problem with your eyes you wouldn't go to the optician and he rustles around the cupboard and says, oh, these the old pair I've had sitting around here for a couple of years. See if you can see out of those. You have a pair of glasses made for you. Um, and that's kind of the same, the same thinking. Um, often with the gait analysis as well, 
I like to couple that with um, with some rehab. So often you'll get an insult and you'll get rehab because it highlights some of the, um, the asymmetry um, or weakness, uh, muscle weakness um, that contributes to lead, poor movement patterns. And if you couple both of those two things together, certainly in the sporting population, you get a really, really good result. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Um, do you accept referrals from osteopaths or does it have to be from a GP? Certainly private referrals. You don't need a referral at all. So you can rock up whenever you want if you're self-funding. Your health insurance, um, you need, I think it's a GP referral or, or certainly an online consultation. So Vupra and WPA, and I think they do use um, an online GP service. Um, what about you, Belle? Uh, yeah, um, 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 it tends to come from uh, all angles, mainly from GPs, I have to say, or physios. But um, I'm not sure at Benedin. I'm sure I'm not sure the pathway how to get in if it's from us. Well, I think Benedin has to be through your GP. Yeah. Um, GP, if yeah. you're a Benedin member, and um, yeah. if you're self-funding, yeah, I think you can just. I think insurance requires a, a doctor to yeah. review before referral as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. So that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you to everyone that has asked a question this evening. Um, if you would like to book your consultation, please do contact us on the number on the screen between 8 and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. You will receive a short survey and I would be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let me have your feedback on today's webinar. Our next webinar is on the 31st of October with consultant gynaecologist Mr Gupta and our nurse specialist Jan Chasley who will be discussing continence care for women. So on behalf of Mr Bell Dinsa, Mr Leon Stapleton, myself and the team at Benedon Hospital, I would like to say thank you very much for joining us this evening and we look forward to you joining us again for another webinar very soon and wish you all a very good evening. Many thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.